Today we're gonna to talk about thermal paste because I was kind of sent by a viewer uh, something that they wanted me to check. And that is specifically this slice engineering uh, boron nitride paste, which is specifically used for 3D printers and like their temperature probes and hotheads and stuff for things that need to conduct heat there. So we're gonna compare it to the Kingpin Extreme because when we talk about thermal paste conductivity, it's kind of nuts what this is capable of. And we're gonna see whether or not it even makes a difference for computers. Today's video is brought to you by the new, really super cool JSUSense Melty Connector shirt. You know, paying tribute to one of the best designs that's clearly ever existed. So get yours by following the link in the description below. Nice. Ow, I have a thigh cramp. <laughs> So when it comes to measuring thermal paste conductivity, it's done in a formula called uh, watts per meter Kelvin. So we're not gonna go into the formulaic equation as to what that actually means, but that is when we're comparing paste conductivity, that's the number referenced. So to put this into perspective, the KPX or the Kingpin Extreme, which I use pretty much everywhere. Oh, by the way, it's like, <laughs> you, <laughs> her best friend. <laughs> Don't worry about that guy. <laughs> He's only there on the weekends. Anyway, moving on. Um, <clears throat> I'm glad she's wearing headphones back there. Yeah, so. so KPX, which is something I've been using for a long time, mostly because of how easy it is to actually apply this paste. It's not too thick, it's not too liquidy. It's kind of perfect right in the middle. In terms of Goldilocks, it's like the just right porridge. You can easily apply it and spread it and don't have to warm it up first or anything like that. It's got a watts per meter Kelvin um, of 13.8. So there you go. So when it comes to the thermal grizzly, the little bitty guy with your little gram, your little gram, this is like what you would get with like an AIO cooler or something like that. You can, you can get bigger, it's under the table now. You can get bigger tubes if you want, um, but that's just one gram. And we'll talk about that in a sec because that is 12.5 uh, watts per meter Kelvin. So already uh, lower than the KPX, right? This is 13.8. The slice engineering boron nitride thermal paste is 31.8, yeah, 31.8. It is extremely high. Um, there's also something to point out though, is it's got very low conductivity and it becomes non-conductive once it's heated up to 100 C. <laughs> so there might be a slight amount of conductivity to this. It's also actually like water soluble. Like it, it's, it dilutes in water nicely. So it's easy to clean up, especially with these rubbing alcohol and stuff. I'm not too concerned about this having a slight amount of conductivity. I bet you I could put it on stuff and it would be fine. It's just, they do, they're up front and saying that it is not fully non-conductive until it's been heated up to hundred C. It's easy to do that these days. Just let any motherboard take any 14 series CPU to its Intel limits being removed. And there you go. There's your hundred C. So yeah, I know that's the die temp, but that will transfer too as well, if you let it run long enough. So I've got KPX pre-installed right now, and I've done some perimeters here to sort of lock down our testing. I've got a 13900K, I've got my voltage locked, I've got my frequencies locked, I've got my fan speeds and my pump speeds locked. So everything is just completely level. It won't dynamically adjust or change. We also have the temperature in this room stuck to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's less important on what those numbers are as compared to what is the before and after test. So one of the things I wanna check right now too is what the initial spike temperature is because one of the, the first line of defense of your cooler being able to do its job is the fact that you have to have a thermal material in between the IHS and the cooler filling in all those microscopic voids and air pockets that will form. And that's what thermal paste does is it fills those voids and it conducts that heat because we all know air is a terrible, terrible conductor of heat. So that's why we need to make sure that we have paste in there. So theoretically, a, a paste that has a higher conductivity should more efficiently move that heat from the heat source, in this case, which is the dye, to the cooler. Now there's a couple layers. There's like a, there's like a cheeseburger layer. Yeah, the fat guy talking about cheeseburgers and is it lunchtime yet? Okay, I digress. There's like a, there's like a Big Mac happening here when it comes to different layers. You have your dye, which is the actual silicon substrate, or not the substrate, but the silicon itself on the substrate. Then you have the thermal interface material in the 13900K's instance. It's like a soldered tim. It's like, it's like a soldered paste. It's not quite soldered. It's something they put in there and they heat from the outside and then it solidifies. So that is moving material from the die to the IHS. Now the IHS is that metal thing that when you look at the CPU that has all the printing and numbers and stuff on it, that 
is responsible for now touching the cooler. But now you have the material between the IHS and your cooler, which is the thermal interface material. So there, there, we might be moving some of that efficiencies around based on how good or how bad it is. So if you have terrible thermal interface material, all that heat is gonna have a bottleneck at the thermal interface material, which means it'll build up at the die and then your clocks slow down and your voltages go down and your computer starts to slow down because of thermal throttling. So we wanna make sure that that heat can get out of the entire CPU array of Big Mac, Paddywhack, give your dog a bone, whatever. I don't know why I went there. Having a bit of a day, let's just go with it, okay? We wanna make sure we get that heat to the cooler as fast as possible. We don't want a thermal paste to be what's holding us back. I don't care about the score so much unless we start slowing down on our CPU. So the package is currently sitting at 33C. So I'm just gonna do a single run first of multi-core and let's see what we spike up to. So it's 82, 84. On the package, you can see our cores are sitting, and the peak cores are low 80s, mid 80s, a couple in the high 70s, mid 70s, 83, 84. It's actually pretty good. We drooped down to 1.78 or 1.285 or so on the vid. That's normal because we do have a droop enabled. Um, they give us a score of a 40,451. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to do a 10 minute test because I wanna see what our max temperature is gonna be as well. Because theoretically, we should not see that number necessarily go up too much higher than a few degrees, because keep in mind, we do have a 360 AIO. As that water temperature gets warmer, we're gonna see the temps climb too, because the thermal capacity of the water is becoming more saturated with the heat that it's exchanging. That's why I have my fans set to 75% static speed instead of 100, uh, just because for noise for the video, honestly, but 75% on this AIO should be plenty with these Vardar fans. And then um, we'll see what our max temperature ceiling's at. Change the thermal paste. We'll take you along for the ride of application. I've not opened one of these yet. I bought three of them, by the way. I got them on Amazon. And I want to see how easy it is to apply and spread because it is water-based. It should be very similar to the Kingpin where it should be easy to apply. And for the kingpin, I did not pre-spread. I just did a line down the very center of the CPU. So we want to see how it spreads as well. Okay, so our package is at 93 currently in this part of the test. Looks like it spiked 94 at least once. That was, and our cores are sitting here in the upper 80s. So we've only got eight seconds left on this test. And then um, we'll see our package wattage actually went up to 310. Because what you may not realize is as temperature goes up, so can power draw. Um, our vid is still around the same at 1.27, 1.28. So that's why our power ended up going up, or at least our wattage, because as temperature goes up, it becomes more inefficient, which means more power to end up maintaining those clock speeds and stuff. And because we removed all those limits, it's why we didn't lose any clock speed. It actually stayed at the 5.7 gigahertz all core, or 5.6 gigahertz all core. Uh, and we're at 6.1 single core right now. So my overclock is apparently doing really well for a down and dirty didn't really try. Okay, so these are what our numbers look like here. Um, I guess what we're looking for now is, is it gonna be any different at all? At, because 92 to 93C is what we were seeing on average right there after 10 minutes. Our cooler was fully saturated. I need to let it cool down right now. You can see our score dropped about a thousand points as well. That's typical as well with high heat. Uh, even though our clock speeds didn't change, they might be changing very quickly, faster than the, the polling rate of the software is, where it might be come down clocking and clocking back up so quickly that it's not picked up in the polling rate, which is what will end up affecting our score. All right, so letting it cool down, we'll apply the, boron, the, the boron nitride, and we'll see if this is gonna be a suitable solution um, for an inexpensive thermal paste. That's, that's the teaser here. That's also why I had that little tube. Okay, so let's see how easy it is to actually apply. Okay, that's a little flaky. So let's try this on a paper towel real quick. <laughs> oh, okay, it really squishes out. <laughs> Jeez. Hold on. Okay, so I'm gonna try and apply this about the same way I did the KPX. This is actually quite a bit thinner than I was expecting. There, I put a lot, because I don't wanna, I need to be careful with the squish out because of the fact that it needs to be hot to, not be thermally conductive? You mean electrically? <laughs> electrically conductive, yes. We want thermal conductivity. We don't want electrical conductivity. Okay, so theoretically, if it squished out, it still should not have killed my computer if it did. Oops. <laughs> there we go. I forgot to plug in the pump. Okay, we got it to 100C. <laughs> Look how fast I came down. 
<laughs> okay, so I was like, uh oh, it's at 100C already. Because I forgot to plug in the pump. Guess what? I think we made, we did the dehydration process. <laughs> <laughs> On accident. Oops. I was wondering how am I gonna how am I gonna make it hit 100 C? Like, should I go with a crazy overclock? No, forget to plug in your pump. That'll do it. Okay, let's clear those min maxes. Pro tip: If you want to throttle, <laughs> plug your pump. Just one run. What do we got right now? So we're at 61, 65, 68, 92, 93. <laughs> 94, 96, or in 90s on all the cores. We did have our full score of 40,456, but that's only because we have nothing in place to make it do any sort of dynamic throttling until it hits 100T. This tells me right now, we have uh, pretty poor conductivity, and I don't think that's gonna be anything to do with the thermal paste itself. I honestly think that might have to do with how watery it is. I think a lot of it just smushed out the side. I really think that that's what the problem is there. So let's do that again. I won't do the 10 minute test at those temperatures because it's just uh, 94, 96, 97. Yeah, 39.827 it came down. Okay, so with that said, let's go ahead and shut this down and let's take off the pump and let's see what the thermal paste looks like because I have a feeling it's so watery and so thin that as soon as I tighten it down, it just smooshed out. Like, I feel like we need some of that thickness to be able to maintain its position between the two surfaces. Because typically what you're doing with this stuff here is you're taking it and you're putting it on like thermal couplers or thermal probe kind of deals. And you're just gooping it all over it and then you're sticking it like in a hole that's reading temperatures of like the printhead and stuff. Because remember, 3D printers have to be able to monitor the temperature. Like it has to know what the temperature of the printhead and stuff is. That way it can monitor when you set, you know, PLA or whatever, it's at 200 and whatever C or it has to know what those temperatures are. So all this, you can just fill that whole void with the white stuff and then it's conducting and sending it back. But it's not having to do it between two pieces of compressed metal at this point. So I have a feeling that all squished out, which means I now have cleanup to do. Actually, no, it didn't. Not, not as much as I thought it would, but you can see right there with how liquid, liquidy it is, it created these like veins, which are really interesting looking. I have a feeling the veins that are left on the IHS will match up with the low spots and the high spots here will match up with those low spots. But clearly it was not transferring heat like if we had thermal paste that looked like that, we definitely wouldn't have had the, we wouldn't have had the best performance, but we would not have seen the instant temperatures that we saw in this case. So now let's see how well it cleans up. <laughs> Since it's water-based, it should work pretty well with isopropyl alcohol. <laughs> Just like wipes right off. Wow. It looks like Elmer's glue. Like I still have to take it out, I think, to get that cleaned up perfectly, but, uh, yeah, well, that's too bad. I was expecting, I was hoping that we would see some good results out of this because five cc's of this was $12.99 from uh, Amazon. And that brings it down to like $2.60 a gram. Whereas like the Thermal Grizzly was like $8.99 a gram. That's what that little tube was. But clearly not all thermal paste types are created equal. All right, so it's all cleaned up. I had to take the CPU out because it definitely got in there. A little bit got on the pins, but I was able to just kind of take care of that with some alcohol. Fortunately, because it's water-based, it's nice that it just dries it up and evaporates it. So um, I wanted to, now we're back on KPX, I wanted to just do a sanity check to make sure everything's running as it should. So if I hit multi-core go, it should spike in the mid 80s. 84, 83, 85, exactly where it was before. I think I said it was like between 84 and 86, and there it is, 84 and 86. So there we go. Imagine chemists knowing more than some average fat YouTuber. <laughs> so look, the, the, the difference is every thermal paste is made up of a couple of different um, materials in there. There's whatever the actual conductive material is, whether it be metal or ceramic or um, crystals in this case, the boron nitride, it's crystals. So there's also the, the suspension material. How is that? How is that crystal being like applied, right? So this one was actually very watery. It's very water-based. Obviously, the chemists that have created thermal paste for computers have figured out the right consistency, where it's not too thin when hot, but not too thick when cold. There's there's a whole process to that. 
Clearly, because of the application that the boron nitrite's being used in for 3D printing, it's a completely different type of application. Like I've already said, it's not having to deal with pressures of components pushing against it, which as it's very thin and watery, will squish out and create a moat around the CPU, which is pretty much what happened. <clears throat> the difference too, is that it has to be able to keep that state under those different um, phase changes. Or in this instance, it did phase change because it got really hot. So it just dried up all the, all the water, those bits, and then turned to a solid. But uh, at the same time, you know, those crystals themselves, like the boron nitride itself has a, a watts per meter Kelvin of like, watts per meter Kelvin of like 700 and something, which was insane. But obviously you can't just have a solid crystal between our CPU and our <gasps> video idea. So just put sand, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Grow a boron <laughs> crystal for this? <laughs> anyway, there you go. The, the, the moral of the story is use the proper stuff. I mean, we've done these videos before with like peanut butter and like, uh, Nutella once, I think we used Oreo cookie filling. I, we've done crazy stuff just to see what would happen. And this one specifically came from an email from someone named Nick, and I won't say his last name. Not our Nick, it's a different Nick. But uh, Nick, there you go. You thought I would make an interesting video, and we learned something today. We learned we're still stupid when it comes to things that are above our pay grade. We're looking at you. <laughs>